So we've been working on better techniques. So we put a green fluorescent protein in these cells in the reverse orientation, and then we let the reverse transcriptase of the virus write it backwards or forwards such that they would turn green. So in the absence of a virus that has a, an infectious virus with reverse transcriptase, so it would have to be a retrovirus, um, the cells would not be green at all, shown down here in the lower corner, or here by um, flow cytometry, um, fluorescence activated cell cell sorting, you see no little dots because they're negative because there's no retrovirus in these cells. But if we take plasma from an MECFS patient and put it on these cells, now we can do it from four days to 18 days, so a little over two weeks, um, and cut the assay down um, by almost a month. And here you can see the pretty bright green cells here, and you can actually quantify the fluorescent activated cell sorting and, 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 and ask how much infectious virus is there. This enables you to start doing drug studies, so in the laboratory you can see if drugs will inhibit the production of infectious virus from cells. So we did these studies, and I'm just showing you here the transmission from CFS patient's plasma into that LNCAP cell line. These are really one-second exposures, which is, I mean, Dan Bertolette did all of these Westerns, hundreds of them, and it's very quick. So there's a lot of virus in the cell and in the plasma that can be transmitted to the cell, and more than 84 um, percent were positive when we looked at the PCR negatives in that study in science. So importantly, there was an absence of protein expression or transmission in the plasma from the healthy donors. All the healthy donors, we essentially only got 4 percent, so I think it was uh, 8 out of 218 or 318. Um, so again, there, it's in the sick people and it's not in the healthy people, and that's how you, the first step in making a disease association. So we could also directly isolate XMRV from the plasma of CFS patients. And we did this by doing a technique known as immune precipitation. So you take an antibody to the virus family member, in this case it was a goat um, anti-XMLV from a BALB2 mouse, and this antibody could directly bind to virus in the plasma, it recognized the virus, and you can pull it right out of the plasma and then sequence it totally. So we see P30 gag as well as P12 with this antibody. So this suggests that these RT-PCR assays or uh, of RNA in the plasma may be a more sensitive way to detect viruses, um, um, the XMRV from these patients. So um, uh, the reviewers asked us quite rightly, if there's that much virus in the plasma, the patient should be making an immune response. Now, and well, go on to show you that. And so these, these assays um, uh, that we use to detect the immune response, we took advantage of Sandy Rossetti's um, longtime basic research. And she had made a cell line in 1982 where she, um, infected a murine B cell line um, that expressed the erythropoietin receptor, and I won't go into the details, but when she infected that with spleen focus forming virus envelope, the cell line grew independently of the growth factor erythropoietin and expressed envelope on its surface all the time. So we simply show a patient's plasma against the unexpressing envelope expressing cell line and show there's no fluorescent signal there. There's no fluorescent signal whatsoever. But if we take it to the envelope expressing cell line, this is a 1 to 10 dilution and we did a 1 to 50 from a patient's plasma directly from it. You could see the binding and then the fluorescence expression by uh, attaching a monoclonal <laughs> antibody um, to uh, high levels of antibody that we showed in the paper could actually be competed by the envelope protein or by the first incubating with this, um, with the monoclonal antibody I showed you. So the patient's plasma has antibody directly in it. So currently, because this is a cumbersome assay and a cell-based assay, um, currently in development, we're making a plate format known as ELISA, where we can do this kind of, of assay in a plate 96 wells at a time, enabling us to get a much higher throughput to do things such as screen patient populations and the blood supply for incidents. 
And when Rachel Bagney did this, she, she looked at what we call a training set of 39 of our um, CFS patients and looked at surface unit, transmembrane unit, and capsid, and you could see antibodies to all three viral proteins, um, um, the strongest by far um, immunodominant epitope is, is on the surface unit. When she looked at blood donors from blood donors provided by um, Harvey Alter of the NIH, she found 10 of 77, and that's, um, that's a high percentage. That's as um, many as uh, eight, 11 or so percent. But interestingly here, it wasn't to the surface unit, but to the transmembrane and capsid. And Rachel's not quite convinced that's um, specific because that's not the biology that she would expect. So she's, plan she's making now a confirmatory Western to prove that those are indeed um, antibodies such as we did in the competition uh, experiment so that those patients would actually be infected. Um, so I go back to slide just to show you that um, with that much virus in the plasma and transmission transmitted, it's important to show the demonstration of a viral particle that you don't just have proteins or, or PCR nucleic acids, you have actual viral proteins budding from the cell. It can't be a contamination, it has to be a true infection if you find it budding from the cell. And when I show you here these darkened spots of the membrane, these are all at, um, viruses, particles that are forming and using the lipids of the membrane to literally bud out of the cell. You see the classic um, mature particle with the, this um, electron dense ring and these nice pictures were done by Kumi and Nagashima at the MCI, our longtime colleague. So, they, um, with, with all of that in mind as background, we started to explore in the last year since the paper came out, what the reason for the discrepancy in the other studies, because as I'm sure you well know, both in prostate cancer and in CFS, um, there were many, uh, at least five studies published in each disease where they didn't detect the virus. Um, for whatever reason. So we started thinking about what the possible reasons for the disparity in these various studies were. Um, so we thought of the examples below, and I'll walk through those and show you. First of all, it could be that the worldwide distribution was scattered like HTLV1, that it's present in the US in the patient populations that we found it in, but not in Europe um, and, um, or, or here in Scandinavia. There were high levels of se there could be higher levels of sequence diversity. That means that the specific techniques might not of PCR might not recognize all the strains in the population. Um, it could be very, uh, very well that the peripheral blood or the prostate were not the major in vivo reservoirs where the where the virus hides and lives. Maybe it's the gut associated lymphoid tissue. So as we all know, there's a lot of gut involvement in, in many of these patients. Maybe it's the lymph nodes and spleen. So this is a very real possibility. And our work suggested this, but I won't go into details. Um, importantly, patient selection, as we just heard Dr. Baumgartner, particularly in CFS, but just as much in prostate cancer, it's not realized how heterogeneous these diseases really are. It's difficult to diagnose a consistent patient population, a homogeneous one, and if you're looking at different diseases, of course, you're not going to find a rare and difficult to detect retrovirus. And of course, there can be, if, if PCR is the only technique in your study and you have an isolated virus, you could have contamination with mouse cells or a product. So let's consider the distribution of HTLV1. And 10 to 20 million people are infected with HTLV1 worldwide. Um, it is, but it's endemic to southwestern Japan, the Caribbean, and South America and in the late 70s. That was when the disease was in those areas. Um, importantly, the incidence in the US is only 0.2%. We don't have a problem with it. We don't screen in the blood supply because um, the incidence is so low, it suggests it's simply not in the US. And the migration of the virus had occurred uh, it, um, other ways throughout the, the uh, continents. So that is, that's an explanation that might make sense. So we asked that given the negative studies in the UK, we um, set out to isolate infectious XMRV 
and detect it, detect anti-XMR V antibodies in the plasma of UKCFS patients. So these patients were selected with very strict criteria for illness. And that is criteria similar, but actually more rigorous than Dan Peterson in the original study. And these patients were housebound or bedridden. They couldn't work. The blood was collected in their home by Phlebotomy Services International or at a very close site so they didn't have to go too far. And what I show you here is there's a concordance of infectious XMRV and anti-XMRV antibodies in the plasma directly from the patients. So we see both virus and antibodies to the virus. And when we, when we tallied up the first 50, um, we found that XMRV was present in CFS patients in the UK at 65%. So here it numbers similar to our original study when you select the patients with the same criteria and use the same assays. So um, I show you that XMRV gag. This is a PCR gel. And we're looking at RNA in the plasma, as I showed you earlier, and you can see there that 24 out of 50, or 48%, were positive when we used the nested PCR um, in, in the Lombardi at all, the second round uh, paper, uh, primer set. Um, importantly, um, this study and the studies I'll show you later on were rigorously controlled for the mouse mitochondria in amplicon so that it wasn't a PCR amplification. And uh, Shai Lowe did this uh, study in his paper, which I'll show you in a few minutes, but uh, it was 10 femtograms of the uh, mouse um, DNA that you could detect. It wasn't in our patient cell line or any of the 50 of the UK patients. So there was no mouse DNA in the patient plasma. And again, we suggest that PCR with standard primers is, is not the most sensitive assay. You want a broad nurse primers, as we heard from uh, Jonas earlier, to maybe detect other family members. And Lowe et al. used this exact same technique as, as we heard he confirmed our study, um, I'll show you in a minute, and found different MLV related sequences in a different cohort of CFS patients and on the East Coast. Not MLB, but not marine leukemia viruses, but MRVs or related viruses. So we sequence the envelope of the, of the virus in those patients from the UK. And you can see here, if you see line number one, the clear band is XMRV in the database, the reference called known as VP62. The polytropic reference is shown here with the base changes. And you see when you look then at the UK samples, they're all VP62 or XMRV. So XMRV is indeed um, in the UK, suggesting the distribution is not limited to the United States. So here is a confirmatory study that we've been talking about. And, and this was done by Shai Xinguo, who is, uh, like me, a longtime AIDS research scientist um, coming from the FDA now, but he was in the NIH. Uh, when I was there, and he detected um, the related sequences, the MRVs, in a patient population diagnosed by Tony Komarov at, at Harvard in the USA. And those of you who know Tony Komarov know that he diagnoses um, uh, CFS patients like Dan Peterson's does. So he uses the most rigorous criteria, which um, now are the Canadian consensus criteria. So they, they use the nested PCR of Lombardi et al. Uh, and found we call it now polytropic MRVs, in 86% of this particular cohort, and importantly now 6.8% of the healthy um, samples drawn from the same time period. And Shai Xing Wo collected these samples in 1991 through 94 when he was looking at non-HIV AIDS. And um, he and I are the only two uh, people that I'm aware of in all of the studies who process their own samples. And that's really important because if you're looking for a retrovirus and a sample's been thawed and refrozen, you'll break up the nucleic acid and you won't be able to isolate it or detect it by PCR. So it's important to understand sample processing as part of virus detection. They rigorously ruled out contamination, as I showed you. Um, and Dr. Komarov went back and got eight, uh, got nine of these CFS patients, and eight of them 
could, um, Shiloh could detect the same gag sequences upon a fresh draw 15 years later. It's not part of the publication, but Frank Rossetti, Harvey asked Frank if he would isolate the virus from um, these patients. He did so and he detected XMRV, suggesting that our cell line preferentially replicates XMRV. Importantly, Rachel Bagney also showed an immune response in these um, nine samples 15 years later. 